Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some malicious compliance stories and our first story of the day is by Mahu. Dissolve my department, demote me and expect the same output? You got it boss. I work in a highly specialized field where it's very difficult to find and train suitable personnel. By pinching pennies and not holding his promises about pay grade changes, my boss successively drove away the three specialists working in the department I led. Right before the last one put in her notice, he argued that a two-person department didn't justify a leadership position and demoted me, and we were integrated, on paper, to another department. This was done outside of any legal framework and with a one-week notice, which is illegal. During the reorganization, the manager of the department we joined was assigned to R&D, and another manager and his deputy promoted to lead the department's daily business. We effectively had no less than three supervisors, all of them lacking managerial training and technical knowledge about the duties of our now defunct department, and only one of them can read the language in which 50% of our reports are written. Right after the reorganization, I was granted one last meeting with the boss, where I pointed out that several of my duties cannot be bestowed upon the mere foot soldier I had become, nor taken over by the new leadership. He answered that his decision was final. I was to revert to my previous job description and take up any future matter with my new supervisors. I did just that and some more. I read the state law and ordinance about state and university employees. Should have done it earlier in hindsight. I discovered that the illegal move by my boss doesn't carry any penalty, so there's screw all I can do legally. I'm allowed to take on private mandates for anything that is not explicitly mentioned in my job description. It's a gift normally meant for professors. I get to take up to 15 days of additional paid leave per year to hold a public office. The pay grade I reverted to doesn't match my responsibilities today, even excluding the absence of leadership position. And there's an independent procedure with state HR to reevaluate the pay grade. The kicker? My old job description that dates back to seven years before is short, to say the least. Three lines that don't even cover 50% of what my duties in the last seven years consisted of. And I have a side gig as a retained firefighter and fire instructor for which I use to take vacation days. This counts as a public office according to state law. The fallout. My new managers both signed the authorization to take on private mandates and public office without understanding the implications. I used all of the 15 days where I legally get paid by the fire department and my employer at the same time. I took on several private mandates, totaling nearly an additional month of salary for four days of work. And the pay grade reevaluation has brought me back to the same income as with the previous leadership position. Oh, and since my specialty now has a bus factor of one and my new supervisors have been unable to staff the open positions, it was very unlucky that I fell ill at the time where I had to submit paperwork for a research grant, costing the institution $30,000 in lost research funds. So knowing that the company did nothing to assist OP on their job duties and having OP being the only one capable of doing it all, do you take enjoyment in the company losing $30,000 because OP was unable to work? Or do you think it's just more exactly what they deserved and not necessarily something to get a lot of joy out of? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Riley Smiley. It's usually not a good idea to pick off the person who keeps the department ahead of schedule. So I work for a grocery store as a personal shopper for their in-house grocery pickup and delivery service. Not to toot my own horn, but I am uncontestedly the fastest and best employee in the entire day shift. For context, I can pick around 100 to 120 unique items per hour, while the average person does around 60, which is the expected minimum. It's safe to say that this department relies on me quite heavily, to the point where the department manager has to find two people to replace me when I can't come to a shift. This is mainly because I find the job pretty boring, so I throw in an AirPod and listen to music. I'm fast, mainly because it makes me feel like I'm actually doing something while I'm here. It's also important to note that there's no incentive for me to perform more than anyone else. I don't get paid more, there's no recognition, I just do it because it keeps me busy. 
Now, one of the assistant store managers doesn't like me. I can't figure out the reason, but she doesn't. Either way, she decided today that it would now be a rule that you couldn't listen to music while picking groceries as they didn't know what you were listening to. Nothing in relation to not being able to hear customers, which I could anyways. Now, I had asked others about this rule, and they hadn't been told anything and were still wearing earbuds and listening to music. It's important for us to have at least a one hour buffer. It allows us to call customers to review changes made to their order and then adjust anything as per their request. This is how we ensure their satisfaction. Today, it was really busy. We could barely keep that buffer with me at full productivity, which I was until being told no more music. That's when things began to nosedive and fast. Within half an hour, we had lost half of our buffer, and by the time I was done with my pick, we had completely lost it. This assistant store manager is now being chewed out by the GM because we're behind and that's a serious issue. She then looks at the chart that shows our pick rates and asks him where I am, explaining that we shouldn't be behind with me there. All the while, I'm sitting there taking my sweet butt time riding bin tags until she confronts me as to why I'm picking so slowly. I explained that I had no obligation to go above and beyond, and that because there was a clear double standard being held, I didn't see a reason to perform at a higher level than the rest of the department. After the cogs in her head finally stopped turning, she realized that it is probably best if she allows me to listen to my music and sends me on my way. Within two hours, I've created us an hour buffer again. Needless to say, she learned an important lesson in cause and effect today that I doubt she'll be forgetting soon. I think it just goes to say, if you have somebody that's a clear MVP and not only that but is a team player, don't piss them off, don't do stuff that gets in their way needlessly, you're just going to end up causing stuff that makes it worse for everybody. This next story is by Shocker Rocker, The Day I Lit an Ambulance on Fire. Several years ago, I was working as an EMT for a small private ambulance company which contracted primarily as a transportation service. The ambulance company employed a pair of mechanics that did regular maintenance on each unit and fixed problems when they came up. The company's CEO was pretty stingy when it came to money, so the rigs were old and a lot of the mechanics' spare time went towards restoring the Impala owned by the CEO's son. I wasn't well liked by the owners and management for one reason or another, but I suspect it's because I frequently spoke my mind. This means that I was tasked with the worst trucks on the worst shifts. One day, my partner and I were dispatched to a scheduled patient transfer from a long-term rehabilitation facility to their home. On our way to the facility, our ambulance overheated. Dispatch was notified and we were told to let them know when the truck cooled so we could get back to work. An hour later, the truck was still hotter than I'd like and I let dispatch know that we needed a new unit. Their solution was to have us drive back and swap our gear into a fresh unit to finish our shift. We would need to drive across town to get back to dispatch, so I let them know that it would take a while as we'd need to pull over every single time the engine overheated. Little else was discussed and we started back. I figured I'd stick to the smaller side roads and take my time avoiding the freeways for the safety of ourselves and other drivers sharing the road. I should also mention that every ambulance has a GPS reporting system that reports all of our telemetry so we're tracked every moment of every day. The moment we pass the first entrance to the freeway, the dispatch manager, we'll call her Mary, calls us on the radio and angrily asks us to explain why we're not following instructions. I opted to give her a phone call to settle this and not have a long drawn out discussion on the public airwaves. Mary accuses my partner and I of wasting time and milking the situation so we wouldn't have to take our share of calls. Mary goes on saying that our intentions were obvious since we're not taking the freeway and as such, when we got back to dispatch, we would be dismissed for the remainder of the day without pay and they would investigate to see if further disciplinary actions would be needed. I tried to let her know that driving on the freeway was unsafe and I would have to stop more frequently but she wouldn't hear it and told me to get back as fast as possible, no more delays. Cue malicious compliance. Our patient monitoring equipment is incredibly expensive and management has stated in the past that if we break it, we're on the hook to replace it. 
So I tell my partner to pack it all up and put it just inside the side door because I wasn't sure what would happen, but chances were good that we'd need to grab it quickly and make our run for it. So as directed, we turn around and head back to the freeway entrance at full speed. I think we made it to the end of the freeway merging lane when the temperature gauge started to redline and we had another 12 miles to go. The further I drove, the hotter the engine got and it started to produce white smoke. Lightly at first, then heavier as we approached the big hill just before our freeway exit. Several cars were passing us and honking their horns to alert us of our peril, but there was no stopping this train. We were filling up the lanes behind us with smoke, and the smell was wretched but the ambulance was still running. As we made it to the top of the hill, the engine cut out and lost all power. Smoke was pouring out the sides of the hood but my vision wasn't compromised, so I coasted it over the shoulder and got it as far off the road as I could safely manage. Once I threw it into park, flames erupted from the engine. I told my partner to get as much equipment evacuated as she could, and I grabbed the fire extinguisher. As I'm trying to put out the fire, my partner is on the phone letting dispatch know that we were forced to stop because our ambulance was on its way to a fiery death. I guess at this point our situation had received enough attention that someone had called 911 and the fire department was dispatched but they pulled up on the opposite side of the freeway watching to make sure that things didn't spiral out of control. We were sure to let dispatch know that the fire department had also arrived. Shortly after our call, the CEO's son showed up in his Impala to pick up the equipment as well as myself and my partner. He was on the phone trying to get a flatbed tow truck out as fast as possible so his smoking ambulance could be removed from public view as quickly as possible. The unit was picked up and towed back to the garage, all while the fire department sat and watched. My partner and I were still sent home for the rest of the day. I celebrated the early start to my weekend with a few drinks and nothing else ever came of it. That unit was retired and never saw service after that, but the mechanic said they owed me a beer I guess, because I brought the end to the worst rig in the fleet and they no longer needed to provide upkeep on it. OP even included a picture of the ambulance smoking on the side of the freeway at the bottom of this post, and I think it's kind of funny how the mechanics came to them and said, Oh, thank God you got rid of the worst rig in the entire fleet. It must have really been an awful time working on that thing then. And our final story of the day is by O2K30C1. New company commander requires soldiers to wear ties with civilian clothing while on tour. I was in a US Army band stationed in Germany in the early 90s. We performed a lot of concerts and events for the public all over the region, usually traveling by bus. Normally we would wear civilian clothing while traveling, then change into a formal military uniform after we arrived, unpacked, and set up for the event. Our normal requirement for civilian clothing was pretty informal, similar to what you might wear in an office for the US. Men had to wear a shirt with a collar, so lots of us wore polo shirts. Jeans were acceptable as long as they were clean and no holes, no hats, etc. I had been there about six months when we got a new company commander. In a band, the commander is a warrant officer and also conducts the band, runs rehearsals, picks music, all that fun stuff. He had been with the unit about two weeks and went along with us on a short two to three day tour to play some concerts for German civilians. When we returned, he started making changes. Most were pretty minor and expected, like what music would be performed, but the biggest change was to our travel dress code. All male soldiers would be required to wear a tie when on tour, never mind that many of these kids were rather young and didn't even own one, other than the flat black tie issued with our Class A uniforms. The next trip was only a few days away and we had better show up ready to go with ties on. And that's when me and my roommate decided to have a little fun. We went to the local thrift shop and bought up all the ugly ties we could find. Paisley ties, Christmas ties, ties with Hawaiian hula girls on them, thin neon colored 80s ties, super wide 70s ties, even a few plaid bow ties. Over the next few days, we handed them out to nearly every person in the unit, including a few women who wanted to get in on the fun. Tour departure day arrives and we have our morning formation in the band hall all standing in rows, dressed and ready to depart, new ties worn. 
The first sergeant is wearing a lovely hula girl tie and grins a bit as he goes over all the usual formalities. Everyone present, all equipment ready to go, last minute instructions, blah blah blah, then calls the company commander in. The new commander steps inside the band hall and freezes. He looks slowly down the lines of soldiers, biting his lip, like he's trying very hard not to say something. He backs out of the room, still not saying a word. About a minute later, he returns, looks right at the first sergeant, and says, Everything ready to go? Yes, sir. Right. Let's hit it. The tour went off without any problems, but the requirement to wear ties was dropped as soon as we got back. Some of us still wore them occasionally for fun. I think that although it was technically complying, I think it's cool of the commander to not have any issues with it. Obviously, they had issues enough with it to remove the requirement after that, but they didn't stop and yell and force everybody to take their ties off and whatnot. They took it all in, they realized everybody was complying, although ridiculously, and decided to take action after they got done with what needed to get done. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today, so if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, and if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So, until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.